Welcome everybody, my name is Doragon and this is my Assassin's Creed Odyssey review in 2021. Before diving into the review itself, I want to address two points. The first point is why I haven't done this sooner, which then leads directly into the second point. Since I put out both my Valhalla review and series ranking in 2021 videos, people have been asking for my retrospective review on Odyssey, especially with some of my comments made about the game in those videos. I've actually had most of this script written for months, and was planning to do this review as part of a retrospective series, but through a multitude of factors, that has gotten away from me. Other games came out, I created other videos, the review got pushed back. Then. We got the horrible revelation that the abuse reported in mid-2020, which was systemic and rampant through management of Ubisoft, had not been addressed, and many perpetrators of the abuse had actually been protected and promoted by Ubisoft. This revelation sickened me. Again, for many reasons, not least of which is a decent moral compass and understanding what consent actually is. But I was also sickened at myself. Despite the allegations and proof provided in mid-2020, I had continued to support Ubisoft. I'd given them the benefit of the doubt, and then my money for multiple games and collector's editions, helping them to achieve their best fiscal year to date. Through my personal actions, I had reinforced to Ubisoft management that what they were doing was correct. And so, they continued. I also benefited from increased viewership and subscriptions on my channel directly from Ubisoft properties. And as those videos are still out there, I do continue to. My initial reaction back in May when this first broke was to swear off Ubisoft and cut all content from my channel. And until this video, I have done that. I've not played any of their games, therefore increasing their metrics. I've not made a single video about them. But I've come to a realisation subsequently. People are already forgetting Ubisoft's actions. Even after more than 1,000 staff signed an open letter demanding change in September that has gone unanswered. Heck, people are forgetting Activision and Blizzard's actions. A company being sued by the state for more than a decade's worth of abuse. That is the equivalent of England suing Media Molecule or Codemasters. People are forgetting or overlooking these facts because there are new games coming from these developers. New games that they want to play. And if they conveniently forget all of the abuse and toxic cultures that the staff are subjected to, they can play the next Call of Duty or Far Cry and not feel guilty about it. There are also those, however, who simply don't know about the situation who need this information put out into the world so that they can become informed on the matter and make their own moral decisions thereafter. My revelation, therefore, is that I should not remain silent. Silence in our world allows the bad guys to get away with it. There's that much missing, edited, misinformation and slander out there that not talking about the reality of the situation is the same as closing your eyes and hoping that the nasty man doesn't continue to sexually assault people. Sure, you won't see it, but no matter how tightly you close those eyes, you'll still know that it's happening and that you did nothing to stop it. So that is my stance on Ubisoft. I personally will not engage with their products until wholesale change is enacted at all Ubisoft studios worldwide. But I will create the content that people want to see. That content, however, will not shy away from the abuse that the company has and continues to commit and promote. It will preface every video of Ubisoft content, and it will close them out. I'm going to have links in the description box below to resources. Some will be to inform you about the Ubisoft situation. Others will hopefully be to help people who are suffering. Phone numbers, contact points, websites, that sort of thing. The big thing I want you to take away from this video is that we shouldn't be silent. We need to talk about this. We need to make it known. And we need to hold those responsible to account. We have a huge amount of power as a fan base, and right now, we have an opportunity to wield that for the power of good. 
to protect and save the amazingly talented individuals that actually make the games that we love. We do this by talking about the issues of their hiring company loudly, by not playing and not buying their games until wholesale change is actually implemented, because money speaks louder than words to corporations. And we need to start doing this now. Because the safety of those members of staff who do not have a way to leave the company due to finances, life situations and the like, deserve to be protected. And their safety is so much more important than us experiencing the next open world game from the toxic company that they work for. For any review of a long-standing series, I feel that it is important that the reviewer outlines their history with said series. My personal reasoning for this actually stems from the early days of Assassin's Creed. I remember reading reviews of 2 and Brotherhood, and the reviewer skipping over the important parts or dismissing them as unnecessary and tacked on. And the reason that they skipped over all of this is because that's what they did in-game. They skipped the important parts, then would complain about their inclusion. That means they were unfairly reviewing or criticising aspects of the game, because they were playing a title made for me through the eyes of someone who doesn't want that, and then complaining that the game wasn't made specifically for them. That's why I feel that it is important that a reviewer outlines their history with the series, to inform the reader, listener or watcher on whether they can trust this review or not. So let me quickly give you my history with Assassin's Creed. I love Assassin's Creed. Or at least I did, once upon a time. I couldn't play the first at launch due to travelling the world, but I played it on my brother's PC upon my return to the UK, and loved it so much I immediately bought the complete version of Assassin's Creed 2 for the PS3. My love for the series grew through the Desmond Saga, becoming my favourite video game franchise along the way. I was worried for the series' direction after Desmond's death, but Assassin's Creed 4 put many of those concerns to bed. And despite a touch of franchise fatigue and poor release states, Assassin's Creed Unity and Syndicate continued that trend and delivered interesting and engaging modern-day stories. But according to Ubisoft, cohesive and ongoing stories that engage the player and please the core fan base that grew the series are never enough, and money talks louder than everything else. Cohesive storytelling, the stories, mechanics, and lore would be abandoned after Syndicate. Origins was good though. It's one of my favourite games in the series due to creating an exceptional springboard for what was to come next, which, at the time, looked like it would be a full circle experience. Through the lowest points and the biggest changes, for me, the story still held Assassin's Creed up. But it was the feeling of those classic games. The extras that you had to search for and discover. The secret side missions, playing by the tenets of the creed, earning the best armour and weapons in the game, easter eggs and lore, that allowed the series to stand unique and triumphant within the industry. That was lost in Origins. And as much as I do love that game, I could feel my beloved series slipping through my fingers. It's important wording of that statement. My series. As things grow in scale and popularity, they do take on new ownership, and the fans become the keepers of the series. To keep them happy, you have to push the boundaries while honouring what came before. Look at Doctor Who, Farscape, Mass Effect and Sonic as prime examples of what happens when you don't honour the fans. That being said, I still loved Assassin's Creed. So that was my point of view coming into Odyssey. A slight feeling of something missing, but nothing majorly broken. So as I always did, I jumped into Odyssey on launch day. So top level overview. Assassin's Creed Odyssey isn't a good game.
Now please stick with me on this, and let me explain why I feel that way. One of the biggest criticisms levied at the game is that it isn't an Assassin's Creed title. And while I do believe that statement to be true, I will address that in depth later as a point on its own. For now, I'm talking about the game itself. Its design, structure, mechanics, story, lore, choices, combat, traversal. Pretty much every aspect of the game is the bare minimum needed to be achieved to attain a designation that it was aiming for. Odyssey calls itself an RPG. And looking at it, yes, you could call it such. But I want to take a closer look at each aspect and show you why it's bare minimum, incorrect or downright dirty practice and explain why that makes me feel that this isn't a good game. Number one. Character. Character is a hyper important part of design in a game and narrative, especially if you are giving the protagonist a name and personality that isn't that of the player. The canonical protagonist of Odyssey is Cassandra. However, as a player, you can choose to play as either Cassandra or Alexios throughout the game. This is a problem, because even though dialogue and motion capture are the same for either protagonist, the delivery, feeling, nuance and impact of each character is vastly different. And my experience as Cassandra was completely different to that of my friends as Alexios. The acting and direction between the two protags is different as well. And to my eyes, much more care was given to Cassandra, whereas the direction for Alexios seemed to be gruffly yell every single line. But why do we get to choose who we play as at all? That's not been a thing in the series before. We've always had well fleshed out playable characters, even if we don't necessarily like them, looking at Shay and Jacob personally. Narratively, the character has to be a specific person due to DNA links. From a narrative perspective, therefore, it makes no sense for this character to be either a man or a woman and be vastly different in their portrayals within the same DNA sequenced events. But I, I do have many more issues than just that with the main character of Odyssey. I mentioned personality at the start of this section. Can anyone tell me what Cassandra's personality is? Because I've put over 150 hours into that game and DLC with her, and I can't tell you. There's a very good reason as to why I cannot. It's because she doesn't have one. Now pitchforks down, please just hear me out. I'm specifically talking about the game version of Cassandra here, as the novel and lore version is a fully fleshed out character. And it's the RPG element of the game that created a hollow protagonist here. It's because Ubisoft haven't committed one way or the other as to which version of an RPG protagonist to use and we've ended up with a weird conglomeration of both types. So let's remind ourselves about those two types. Type 1 is an empty protagonist, the sort that you see in Fallout or Elder Scrolls, and generally this character will come from a make your own character menu prior to starting the game. There are no dialogue lines or personality traits specific to this character. Instead, the player projects their idea of their created character onto the avatar, and they will play the game in that particular way. This means that the player has the freedom to be a white knight type paladin all the way through to mass murdering selfish dictator, or any variation in between. And the choices made by the player, no matter how disparate in nature, will be true for their created character's personality. Type 2 is a ready formed character. Geralt from The Witcher or Commander Shepard from Mass Effect type characters. You know who these characters are what they stand for and their motivations, and therefore any choices that you make within the game remain in character with the protagonist, no matter how good or evil you choose to be. Geralt will always act as Geralt regardless of your in-game actions and so on. Cassandra though? Well, she doesn't want to be pigeonholed, so she does a bit of both. This creates a characterization problem, because narrative design and characterization are at odds with one another in this title. The problem is most apparent whenever there is a dialogue choice within the game. I can pretty much boil down for you now what every option will be. You have the be a nice person option, then you have the be an asshole option, and finally 
you have the jump into bed and make happy fun times option. In every single dialogue choice, they are your options. Now, if you play the game only choosing one of these options, say, always being the nice person, Cassandra would be a sweet, caring, and compassionate character, and it will seem to you that that is the character's personality. But a game such as this one, that can be played multiple ways, and as directed by Ubisoft pre-release, if you want to be the good guy in one mission but the asshole in the next, you can and should, the problem that you face by doing that with this game is that the asshole characteristics and nice person characteristics are not of the same character. Sure, they're acted by the same talented actress, but what you actually end up with is two very disparate personalities. There is great continuity if you only choose the nice person route, and there is great continuity if you only choose the asshole route through the game. But if you choose to switch between the two, as the development studio said you could and should, there is no common thread. There is no continuity, as the two sides of the character have been written, directed, and acted completely separately of one another. What this leads to is a realization that there are no underpinning traits or personality to the character that you are playing as, which in turn breaks the character narrative. This means that unlike Geralt in The Witcher 3, where he will always act as Geralt no matter how nice or mean you choose his dialogue lines to be, because Cassandra is so polar opposite in her delivery of the two sides, you cannot boil the character down to any specific character traits, as the writing simply doesn't allow for any. Then, you get the sleep with everyone option. Now giving the player the autonomy to take that choice isn't necessarily a bad thing. However, giving the player the option to take that choice with the big bad of the game, that the narrative has told you for over 100 hours must be killed to protect the world, and then won't die if you do take that option, breaks character narrative once again. And it does this as the final beat of the game the final character point, and it leaves a very sour taste in the mouth. But as you could probably expect, it goes further for me. There is a giant disconnect between narrative moments and gameplay in Odyssey. In the background footage that you are watching, there is a cutscene where Cassandra is ripping enemies apart with Brasiadas, but the moment that you return to the gameplay, she is weak and takes a long time to kill a single enemy. A single grunt enemy at that. You are told at some point in the game that she is likely 6% Isu, which is 100 times greater than Desmond's incredibly high Isu DNA concentration from earlier in the series. It means she can teleport after throwing the spear and jump from massive heights without fall damage. She's super strong and essentially superhuman in narrative and traversal moments. But put her in combat, and she takes five minutes to kill six grunts and has to heal multiple times to achieve it. She goes on about protecting innocence in cutscenes, regardless of dialogue choices you've made throughout the game. But you can walk through a town and kill everyone for no apparent reason. In the DLC Legacy of the First Blade, she swears that she loves Natakas and that they are one, but she will be sleeping with anyone else that moves through dialogue choices while supposedly being married and loyal to him. There is just no consistency between one moment and the next when it comes to characterization. Gameplay doesn't match cutscenes, and even cutscenes don't seem to know what each other are doing. The portrayal of different emotions and reactions come across as different people emanating from the same avatar. There's no cohesion between what you've just watched and what you're then doing and vice versa. There's no character traits or personality unless you choose to go with one particular option the entire way through and make that choice within the first five minutes of the game. All of these faults coalesce to mean that you never really feel connected to this weird protagonist, and as such, you aren't then connected to the game or supporting characters. Number 2. Mission Design I imagine this is going to cop me some disgruntled comments if I haven't received loads already. But mission design in Odyssey is lazy. Like, really lazy. As in, there are only two designs of missions used regularly, 
and over the course of 100 plus hours for the main game alone, let alone any DLC, this design choice becomes really, really boring. Just to make sure this isn't a coloured judgement of mine, I've replayed the early game to ensure that this isn't just a latter game and DLC problem, where they were maybe rushing to get the finished product out. And it isn't. The two main mission designs that you encounter throughout the entirety of Assassin's Creed Odyssey are as follows. Design 1. Speak to a person who tells you to go somewhere else. Travel in a straight line to that location because you can climb everything and there is no fall damage. Kill everything at that location, on the odd occasion after using Horus to identify a target and then killing everything. Travel back to the original quest giver wherever they now are, again in a straight line. Mission complete. Rinse and repeat. Design 2 Speak to a person who tells you to go somewhere else. Travel in a straight line to that location because you can climb everything and there is no fall damage. Find what they have sent you to obtain at that location. It's okay, you don't actually have to look for it. You'll be guided by the hand thanks to the HUD and map. Kill everything whilst you're there because there is no stealth and dead things don't hinder your progress. Then, after killing everything, travel back to the original quest giver, wherever they now are, again in a straight line. Mission complete. Rinse and repeat. Now, you could throw boss battles in as a third design choice. So let's outline those. Boss Battle Observe boss for one minute so they show all of their very predictable moves. Do chip damage in the downtime between those moves. Dodge out of the way when the animation starts on a move to avoid damage. Repeat infinitum while the damage sponge's health is slowly... 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 whittled down until you win. That's it. That's near enough the entire mission variation throughout the whole of Odyssey. Alright, alright, you've got some naval sections. But they're a dumbed down mess and are so rare that they barely feature in my 150 plus hour experience. There is, of course, the odd escort mission as well. They're a Ubisoft staple after all, so they had to be there somewhere. Though, they are just go from point A to point B in a straight line, like in Design 1 and Design 2. I don't think I'm asking for the world here when I want more varied mission design, especially in such a large and long experience as Odyssey. I'm not naive enough to think that every mission will be unique. I've played enough open world games in my time to know that there will be some cycling of specific mission types. It's true for whichever open world you play. Ghost of Tsushima, for example, will have plenty of go to a point eliminate the enemy quests. But it also has polar opposite quests, where you help someone build a new home by offering them materials and words of encouragement. The Witcher 3 has many beast battles with a similar setup to Odyssey's boss battles, but arenas, agility of the beast, magics and so on keep those missions fresh throughout what can be a 300 plus hour playthrough, and they make up such a small sector of the mission types that you will actually encounter throughout the game. Grand Theft Auto has flying missions, heists, infiltrations, car chases, shootouts, disturbances, and many more options for their missions. And this has been true since the PS2 era for that franchise. So why such a small pool of choice for Odyssey? It's not a question that I have an answer to. The only people who have a definitive answer are Ubisoft Quebec. My suspicion, however, is that they knew that they could, and I say this in inverted commas, perfect those few designs and use them across the largest game world ever made by Ubisoft with little to no issues or bugs. If that suspicion is true, it shows a single-minded lack of care to the quality of player experience. Sure, no bugs is great, and Odyssey is one of the least bug-riddled games made by Ubisoft. But it's still bug-riddled. That focus on less mission variation, therefore, hasn't achieved that smoothness they may have wanted, and the situation results in player boredom because they're doing the same things with such regularity throughout the game that they just want a variation in experience. This feeling is why only 24% of all players who have picked up Odyssey completed its main story. And that figure was true as of mid-2019. In 2021, it is likely a much smaller figure, with more people picking the game up cheaply and not progressing once that boredom sets in. It's not a situation players or game developers want to encounter, 
and it's not something that can be patched or corrected after launch, especially when all additional content and DLC follow the exact same design pattern. This all means that from a mission design perspective alone, Odyssey is just a really boring game to play. Number 3. Narrative Narrative is probably going to be my biggest section, and three years down the line in such a deep dive review, please expect spoilers in this sector of the video. There are timestamps in the description box and chapters in the play bar, so please feel free to skip to the next section if you don't want to encounter any spoilers about this game. Otherwise, let's dive into it. I have two main questions about the Odyssey narrative. What? And why? After 150 hours, I don't think that either of those questions are a positive one to have. To put some perspective on this, Mountain Leader is a qualification that allows you to take inexperienced hikers mountain climbing. Now there's a lot of work involved in this qualification, but one of the areas is experience. To be able to undertake the examination for this qualification, you need 100 hours experience hiking on mountains. That's 100 hours hiking up mountains, down mountains, and remaining safe the entire way. After 100 hours, it is deemed that you have enough experience and knowledge to be able to pass that on to somebody else, and to do it safely. You can't be asking what or why at this point. You have to know. So after a 150 hour story, the fact that I have both of those questions should be a massive red flag for Odyssey. If you're watching this video, you'll be aware that there are three main narrative threads in an Assassin's Creed game. The past, the present, and Isu stories. I want to start with the present, and Layla. In Odyssey, Layla starts with Cassandra's spear. She wants it to obtain a DNA sample from and start reliving Cassandra's memories. But why? We don't actually know. Nothing is actually outlined to us when entering the Animus, other than a book by Herotado saying something about a descendant. Unfortunately, this isn't really expanded upon in the present or in the past. It's only in lore outside of the game that you realise and understand that Cassandra is the descendant Herotado spoke about, and that is what Layla is looking into. But even then, you're not offered more depth. Once in the Animus, you then don't leave it again until the Atlantis storyline is done, which could be over a hundred game hours later and literal real world days or weeks later. As you leave the Animus, at the end of that storyline though, you question why Layla ever comes into contact with the spear in the first place. You know Cassandra is alive, and that spear is not only a massively powerful Isu weapon like the staff that we just watched Cassandra obtain in Atlantis, but a keepsake of her grandfather, King Leonidas, a celebrated character in world history from the Persian attack on the 300. There is literally no reason for Cassandra to let go of it and possibly have it fall into the wrong hands before she meets up with Layla. There's nothing to say that Cassandra placed the spear in that specific location for Layla to find, and they never address it when speaking to one another. It's just left, hanging, unanswered. The ending of the present day is obviously a setup for the DLC as well. The second DLC at that, which wouldn't come out for nine more months. So there's no closure, no feeling of completion after a hundred hours of gameplay. It just stops, and you have to pay more money to get the rest of the story. The modern day in Assassin's Creed is the whole reason for being of the game. It gives the impetus to exploring the ancestor memories, and there's a payoff at the end. Or at least, there should be. Odyssey hits none of those beats. It actively spends as little time as possible in the modern day story, and as such, it ended up being really hollow and dumbed down, giving the whole thing zero meaning. If you do take the DLC into consideration to round out the modern day, there is a little bit more of Layla's arc. After meeting Cassandra and obtaining the staff, Layla is then corrupted by it less than 10 hours later. 
She kills her new best friend after the last one died 12 months ago in Egypt, at which point Otso Berg shows up, an ex-high-ranking member of the Templar Order, who left the Templar Order earlier in the series, yet turns up as a member of the Templar Order to steal the staff from Layla for the Templars. Again, with no explanation as to why he's back with the Order. The modern day story is just erratic, as are Layla's actions and personality. She's merciless in Odyssey's DLC. She paralyzes Berg and leaves him to suffer, and act wholeheartedly against the Brotherhood's tenets. She yells, I'll always be an assassin, in direct contradiction to her statements from just 12 months earlier, where she stated she'd never join the assassins, she's just safer with them for now. She even says that she's going to say goodbye to people in the Animus at the end of the story, something that is impossible according to how an Animus works, and as one of the premier Animus engineers on the planet, she definitely know that. And this exchange? This happens while she is smiling about going back into the Animus, as Victoria's still warm body is just to her right, who she's meant to be distraught about killing. There are character moments that just happen, with no link to what happened in the previous game and no build up to that moment or revelation. These things happen in a microcosm, completely on their own, and for the most part, they don't have any bearing on what came next in Valhalla either. The character that we were introduced to in Origins feels like they don't appear in Odyssey. Instead, it feels like four other characters are just wearing her avatar, and her story is then presented in really short modern day snippets, so the studio can tick a box and say that it was included with minimal effort. I hate all of this. Yes, it undermines the rules of making an Assassin's Creed game, but more importantly for me, and player engagement, it drives us away from the character that we're meant to be connecting with, that is driving this era of Assassin's Creed stories forward that is actually the main character of the franchise at this point in time. There's no build-up or explanation to these events beyond because Peace of Eden, because Book says so. And this all means that the modern day in Odyssey is poorly written and directed, which by extension means poorly acted as well. The ancestor memories with Cassandra are very similar with a massive question of why. Ancestor memories is an important thing to note from that statement. Now I don't know about you, but I only remember things the way that I experienced them. While other people may have slightly different recollections, the general consensus will be near identical. That's how memories work. So please explain to me how seven different players can all experience vastly different memories with Cassandra's journey. Sure, there'll be some crossover of those seven people. There's only four endings to the family arc after all, but there are also multiple endings to the ancient arc, sorry, Cult of Cosmos arc, and the Atlantis storyline too, putting many different variations out into the world. Why? That isn't how memories work. That isn't how the Animus works. And therefore, Within 30 minutes of starting the game, Odyssey has already broken 11 years of narrative continuity within the series. And you want me to continue after that betrayal? Now don't get me wrong, lack of continuity with the rest of the series is a major gripe and enough to drive any long time fan away. But what's worse is that Odyssey, over this massive game, does nothing with Cassandra's narrative. Because every player can have a different ending, and the character has no real character traits, it means that regardless of how good or bad the ending of the family arc, Atlantis and cult arcs are for you, Cassandra ends them exactly as she started them. There's no change in her outlook on life, no change in her actions or approach to situations. Through her quest, Cassandra has seen Minotaurs, I'll get to the inclusion of mythical creatures in a bit, don't you worry. Medusa, Titan Cyclopses, Isu Temples that upgrade her kit, Pythagoras, her 200 year old father who gives her a staff that makes her immortal, and she doesn't change at all. She's muscle for hire at the start of the game and she's muscle for hire at the end of the game. 
nothing changes. In fact, gameplay doubles down on the mercenary thing after these arcs, telling you to be even better muscle for hire and continue rising through the ranks. There's no character arc, no character revelation, no narrative message other than keep making numbers go up. Odyssey's story, in all of its different arcs, just exists. And that's not satisfying. Now I've had many comments about my thoughts on Odyssey from previous Assassin's Creed videos. And one of the more regular defensive statements about my story gripes with the game is along the lines of, Oh, you want the game to expand on story and lore every time? What? Yeah, I do. 100%. I want that, because that is what 10 previous games have done. That is what this series has advised me it will do. We have 10 other titles that all adhere to the same rules of how to make and tell a story in this series. And Odyssey just does none of it. It doesn't even live up to its own marketing of create your own sprawling Odyssey. It is constrained to four options, not the infinite ones that the marketing led you to believe. There's nothing sprawling about it other than the physical distance you have to travel. It's four choices at four very obvious points in the narrative. There's about as much nuance there as choosing the good or bad option in the infamous games. Probably its biggest sin, though, is that it's forgettable. It has forgettable characters and characterization. The locations are forgettable. I remember certain buildings and areas, but I can't tell you where they are. Unlike, say, Assassin's Creed 2, where I could verbally guide you around the game world blindfolded. It has forgettable combat and boss battles. It has, and I have no idea how you even manage this bit, forgettable links to real world history. Have you looked into Greek history? It's amazing! How do you manage to make such stellar source material forgettable? To my eyes, being forgettable is the worst sin that a story can commit. You remember the good stories. They stay with you and can even inform aspects of your life moving forward. You remember the bad stories. If nothing else, to remember what to avoid in other stories. Or, they're so bad that they go full circle and become good again. Forgettable, though? Well, they're exactly that. Forgettable. The only reason any aspect of Odyssey's story sticks with me is the undermining of the rest of the franchise and the disappointment it left me feeling. Like its protagonist, it doesn't have any heart or character and goes for size over quality. What we are then left with is a completely hollow feeling as the character and story both have no substance to carry this title. Number 4. Skill Tree and Progression Progression in Odyssey... sucks. I'll touch on it more later in the in-game store section of the review as to exactly why, but it just doesn't feel rewarding to play. You will grind in this game, and unless you buy an additional XP boost with more real-world money, you're gonna grind... a lot. The thing is, even with that grinding, you're not going to get build diversity. This image on screen now is my skill tree prior to the Fate of Atlantis DLC. This means I have completed the main game, earned the Platinum Trophy, completed the Legacy of the First Blade DLC, and all Tales of Greece. No small amount of game time there, well over the 120 hour mark and there are still so many skills unobtained or not fully upgraded. And the way that the skill tree works, you have to unlock some earlier ones before you can unlock later ones. Even if you think you'll never use those early skills, you still have to unlock them. Due to this, you're locking yourself into a character build from the moment that you earn your first skill point. Now, yes, the eagle-eyed among you will notice that you can reset and reassign your skills as noted in the bottom right of the screen. Thing is, what you're seeing here are those reassigned skills. I've already done that at this point, and I don't have any build diversity. 
The same comment is true come the end of The Fate of Atlantis, as that adds skill enhancements on top of skills that you already have, improving them further, and therefore meaning your ever more valuable skill points will be more likely to be spent on those that are part of your existing build rather than new and diverse ones. But hey, I've made this build. This is what I've chosen at this point. So why am I calling it out as an issue? Put simply, because it's boring. RPGs work because they are open. They allow a player to approach things in many different manners, in a way that suits the player's mood in that moment. By changing weapons, skills, mods and perks, your character can become a completely different force of nature, whether you choose to silently take everybody out or choose to march through the front gate challenging head on. Because Odyssey doesn't have changeable perks, because it has a skill tree limited by an unfair level grind, your build diversity is limited to changing weapons and armor only. Weapons and armor earn 27 times each from the abundance of loot chests in the world. Weapons and armor that you've scrapped 27 times previously because they just aren't good. You are limited then to just the legendary sets, which you have to wear a full set of to get the perk activation. And in a game where healing takes up a skill slot and adrenaline, which is otherwise used for your fighting skills, it leaves you with exactly one set of armor to use that heals you upon damage dealt. Odyssey calls itself an RPG, but unless you are in the top 1% skill bracket of the game, the manner in which all of this progression and combat systems interact with one another force you into this single route. This single armor set, and a very similar skill distribution to mine at this point in the game. It's the only way that you can take on higher levels, because you're not going to be matching them from the XP grind alone. It's the only way that you'll last mob or boss battles, because they last for 10 or even 20 minutes each. The progression system is so unbalanced, forcing a lack of diversity and therefore breeds disinterest. All in all, it's just not good. Number five, the open world. Open worlds have been getting bigger and better for years. Except, I don't believe that comment. They've been getting bigger, sure, no one can refute that. But better? Now that's a matter of opinion. Bigger is not always inherently better. Example, I have a 55 inch 4K HDR Android TV. This sits on the wall in my living room and is the entertainment hub of the house. But 55 inches is the absolute biggest that that screen should be in that room. In fact, the only reason 55 inches works at all is the lack of bezels around that display. If we were to bump that display up to, say, 65 inches or even 75 inches, the TV would dominate the space. It would, therefore, dominate conversation. The sheer size would mean you're constantly moving your head when watching a movie, like watching a tennis match live. Any bigger than 55 inches in that room, and it becomes work to watch and use the television. It's about getting the correct ratio. Essentially, the right size and resolution screen for how far away from it you sit. Open worlds require that same ratio in their design. They can be large, they can be massive even, but they need to be correct. Their size should be defined by their purpose. If the story requires it, they can be huge, but by that same token, they can also be much smaller and still deliver a quality experience. Empty traversal space is required to make the in-between moments reflective and those moments of discovery worthwhile. And the traversal itself should be a system and engine that is fun and engaging on its own. There should be fun things scattered around the world that can be stumbled upon or missed, whether they be side missions, collectibles or just cool easter eggs. And for an Assassin's Creed game, they should be historically accurate and memorable. There are aspects of this that Odyssey gets right. Historical accuracy, for example. 
mean, that's always been the case in this franchise. The maps are brilliantly accurate, and I've used my Assassin's Creed knowledge to navigate modern day Rome and Firenze. And it's the same here. Wherever you visit, it has been built the same as that location was at that moment in history. As always, brilliantly accurate. But that's about where my positives end. Okay, empty traversal space. Don't get me wrong, Odyssey has this. But that's kind of all it has. You see everything laid out for you on the map the moment you've hit a viewpoint. Once you're synchronized at said viewpoint, you then have everything of note in the local region populated on your map by a question mark. You can then add a waypoint to that question mark and have your horse automatically take you to it. My problem with this scenario is multifaceted. Let's start with the whole scenario being nothing but empty traversal. Like I say, that empty space and time has its place. It's great for reflection and preparation, and those quiet moments are needed to give the bigger moments gravitas. But when that's all you get, because enemies are only at question marks, or the easter eggs are only at question marks, essentially anything of note is only at a question mark and so on, your traversal is then only empty. And like mission design earlier, that just means it becomes really boring really quickly. Rather than address that by making the traversal interesting, Auto Ride has been added by Ubisoft. Press a button and your horse starts heading to the map marker with no player input. At this point, traversal just happens. The player isn't actually required at all. They're not playing the game at this point, they're not even involved with what's happening on screen. They may not be in the same room. So why include traversal in the game at all, when the developer has worked so hard to make sure you never have to use it? There's no discovery either, because of those question marks. You can look around the world outside of those question marks all you want. You won't find anything. So traversal is boring. All engaging content is marked out for you on the map. And then, the world is just... empty. If I set my horse to auto travel, the only sound I will hear the entire way are those made by my horse. No sounds of wildlife, no people or cities, just... nothing. Utter silence. I won't even get attacked on the road during that auto travel, because enemies are only at question marks. If I stand still in the middle of a town or city, the level of noise is so low that you'd not really know if anyone lived in these locations. And then, the world is massive, humongous, one of the biggest game worlds I've ever encountered. A game world that big, with traversal so boring even the developers engineered it out, that has no discovery and no life within it, like, what is the purpose of Odyssey's game world? It's so big that the DLC and the Tales of Greece had to be written to take you to specific areas because you never went near those locations in the main game, leaving vast swathes of the map unexplored. They literally had to release additional content to try and make use of the entire map. And even then, they didn't manage to. Massive, boring, empty, unused. Odyssey could have told the same story in a much more compact game world, and probably been better for it. There is no purpose to the scale of the world other than bragging rights to say that it's the biggest one yet. It's just not good design. And it's yet another negative that didn't really need to be one for this game. Number six. Mechanics. Oh man. I'm not quite sure where to start here. 
You see, the thing is, you press a button, something happens. Yes, bare minimum from mechanics, I know, but there have been a lot of games in the last few years where that hasn't been the case, so worth pointing out. I take issue with the mechanics and systems of this game. Many we've already spoken about, like traversal, progression, mission design, the open world, even things that aren't really mechanic-based, such as the character and narrative. But mechanics are every moment of the game, and other than a couple of standouts, they're just sort of there. Menus, for example. They are there and they do their job. Nothing exceptional or unseen before, just solid in a tried and tested way. Free running doesn't exist in this game, but climbing and jumping does. It's a little boring because Cassandra can climb anything and jump from any height, so there's no thought needed to utilize the system. Just press X and forward, and you're doing it. Works, though. There's many more aspects like this. They all do their job, just not in a particularly engaging way. So, what about those standouts? Let's start with the Assassin's Creed series staple mechanic, Stealth. <clears throat> yeah. If you want to have a good time in this game, don't even try to use Stealth. It has been that muted and hindered that it is obvious that Ubisoft Quebec never wanted to include it in the first place. You can't assassinate anyone due to the number spam health bars, and the actual act of sneaking up is impossible because there is no stealth system other than crouch. Enemies will spot you immediately from 200 meters away and raise the alarm. As there is then no payoff to using stealth, despite my best efforts, there's just no reason to use such an underbaked and half-hearted system. So, the other standout is combat. This background footage is of me fighting grunt enemies. Yes, these guys are from the DLC, but the sentiment rings true throughout the game. I started this fight at the beginning of the time bar. It took me 8 minutes and 50 seconds, 9 minutes, near as makes no difference, to defeat a single mob of grunts. A 9 minute fight with trash enemies. And the last guy that I took out, I had been wailing on since the start of that nine minute session. Am I not meant to be a descendant of the Isu, unbeatable with a blade and a stylish badass in this game? Because I don't feel any of that in combat encounters such as this. Alright, big boy Cerberus here. Eight minutes to take out the doggy with dodge, shoot an arrow, dodge, shoot an arrow. As a comparison, Oryx the Taken King, a Destiny raid boss that requires six people to even attempt and has way more mechanics and coordination to pull off, takes the same or less amount of time. One of those boss fights is varied and engaging and has a huge feeling of achievement upon completion. The other is in Assassin's Creed Odyssey and is repeated for every boss fight in the game. You feel powerless in combat in this game, even with the superhuman moves from the skill tree. Every encounter is just numbers in the thousands bouncing around your screen and health bars being chipped slowly away. Except for your own, which will disappear with a single hit from any foe. Every combat move is a full animation as well. So if I start a heavy attack and can see an enemy swinging for me, I can't dodge out of the way of it prior to my animation finishing, even though my awareness and reactions allow for the dodge to happen. Look, there's only so many things that you actually engage with in a meaningful way in Odyssey. Traversal is automatic with a single button press. Discovery is removed with the question marks on the map. Mission design has minimal variation, so your stealth and combat encounters are the main way that you interact with the game and they're at best frustrating, and at worst, designed to hinder the player progression. And they want you to do this for more than a hundred hours? It's just exhausting. It's unrewarding. 
and it's yet another bad aspect of this game. Number 7. In-game store. By far the worst aspect of this game is the microtransactions. Any game that utilises microtransactions has to take them into account at every phase of design, from concept to completion. That means that there are aspects of the game that are made differently because microtransactions are involved. If you think that's not the case, look at the Sparrow and Ghost Shell economy in Destiny 2 compared to the one in Destiny. Aesthetic items, sure, but no longer are they rare gameplay drops. No longer are ghosts integral to your character build. Instead, you can buy them. For real-world money. And while that doesn't impact the actual gameplay, it does impact player engagement and rewards. Not convinced? What about the fact that there are now weapons locked behind a further paywall of a season pass? Or content for limited time events that has an additional charge? Adding those microtransactions fundamentally changed how Destiny was made, and where the best looking and most useful loot came from. It was, and to a big degree still is the case, that it's no longer from top-end gameplay. When you look back on the best parts of the Assassin's Creed series, one of the first things that many people will mention are the Assassin Tombs from AC2, and then the Armour of Altair that comes from completing all of them. This was integral to the game and story. It shows a level of determination and problem solving from both Ezio and the player to obtain all six keys. It is a late or end game unlock, allowing you to take that step up that felt it was missing otherwise. As Ezio is wearing that armour at the start of Brotherhood, it is integral to the multi-game story too. It's so well remembered because of the gameplay leading up to the best looking and most useful outfit in the game. You had to earn it, and it was rewarding when you did. But now? Imagine just buying that armour with additional real-world cash, and the Assassin Tombs disappearing. That is the exact situation that you find yourself in with Odyssey. The best looking and the best performing armour sets in this game are all in the store, and to buy them is no small cost. If you want just one of these armour and weapon sets, as the perks are great and suit your playstyle, and you can't get those same perks through gameplay alone, you have to spend an additional £16 per outfit. Now they don't cost £16 of store currency these sets. It is near a £10, but those store currency packs come in at £8 or £16 only. There is no £10 option, so you are hit with a £6 surcharge if you only want the one armour set, or you are looking for a second set to buy to only then add another £8 currency pack of store credit for the cheapest option. Look, when the best design is going into the store items, it isn't then going into the main game. When there are more sets of desirable store armour than desirable in-game armour, that design and talent isn't going into the main game. When there is no gameplay loop to obtain the best looking and best performing armour, player engagement has actively been removed from the game in favour of microtransactions. When that player engagement is removed, story beats that would otherwise come from said gameplay loop are lost. There's also the name of these things. Microtransactions. Itty bitty. Teeny weeny. Really, really small. Now last I checked with my bank balance, there is nothing micro about a 16 or 20 pound transaction. Like, I've bought full games for less than that, and put multiple dinners on the table for a family of four. So how are these classed as microtransactions? You then have to take into account the real money purchasable XP boost for this game. Now what would be the reason that you feel the need to sell an XP booster for your game? If you've done your job right as a developer, and designed and crafted your game well, it will be balanced appropriately. The XP and level curve should be engaging in and of itself. When you then add a story and mechanics atop of it, and you can see yourself improving, 
it should lead to meaningful growth and engagement within the game world. At no point should a well-designed system need a purchasable boost, yet Odyssey had it available from launch in the store. This is downright predatory practice. The inclusion of that XP boost means that the game was purposely made to be unbalanced against the player. Not completely, but a large and noticeable amount. Enough that the XP grind is tedious without the boost, and therefore said boost becomes a very alluring concept. And that ever more difficult grind may just force the player's hand to purchase said boost and make their gameplay that bit more rewarding. That feeling of reward and satisfaction shouldn't come from an in-game store. That's the entire point of making a video game in the first place. Fun, escapism, satisfaction and enjoyment. But Odyssey was designed to prey on and abuse its players rather than reward them. It engages them just enough to make them want to progress, but then makes that progression so hard that the player needs to drop more money to do it in an industry standard manner. This predatory practice rings true for every purchasable from the store. There are so many different time savers available, from maps leading to loot to in-game currencies that are a chore to find through gameplay alone. Other utilities, as the game calls them, like crafting and upgrade materials, unique and highly rolled weapons, again, unobtainable in the game. To have the best experience with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, you first need to buy the game, at the time of writing £54.99 on PSN. Then you need to buy the season pass to experience the actual full story, at £24.99 as seen here on Stadia. Realistically, that XP boost in at least one armour set will be required to make the game enjoyable, so we're looking at the extra large Helix credits pack of £39.99 from platform or in-game stores, with a little left over for utilities. And with just those three things, without any of the collector's stuff or digital bonuses, no physical media or physical items usable outside of this one game, no additional store purchases that you may want from an aesthetic standpoint, you've just spent £119.97 for a single, repetitive, unbalanced, predatory game. £120 of your money to be taken advantage of. At best, this situation is underhanded money-making tactics at the detriment of game design. At worst, this is Ubisoft blatantly abusing their fanbase and being heralded for it. Microtransactions are poison on any franchise. But for a series that used to pride itself on lore, player engagement, in-game secrets and rewards for said secrets, to have most of its reward content put behind a further paywall and the removal of the gameplay content that those rewards used to come from just leaves this game feeling like a shell of its predecessors and leaves a very nasty taste in its wake. Number 8. It's not Assassin's Creed. This is a cardinal sin for any long-running series, to have an installment not be what it says it is. But for one steeped in 11 years of lore, stories, revelations, franchise rules and fan expectation, to not be an Assassin's Creed game with that name upon the box is a stab in the back. To determine whether or not this is actually an Assassin's Creed game is actually really easy, because we have the Ten Commandments that Ubisoft has to adhere to to make an Assassin's Creed game an Assassin's Creed game. So let's run through them. 1. Assassin's Creed will always tell the story of the secret war between Assassins and Templars. This game's ancestor sector is set 400 years before Bayek and Aya's story from Origins, where the Hidden Ones were formed in response to the Order of the Ancients, the Proto-Assassins and Templars respectively. Therefore, they simply cannot be part of the story in this game, because they won't exist for another 400 years. In the modern day, well, we don't spend enough time there to have any story, and most of it that claims to be the Assassin vs Templar story is locked behind a season pass paywall. Failed criteria. 2. 
Being an assassin doesn't make the main character a ruthless killer. They kill, but they have principles and never murder innocents. They avoid collateral damage as much as possible. Why can I walk through a town and murder everybody without desyncing? Why can I not block defending innocent bystanders from foes' attacks? Let's not forget, Cassandra is a mercenary. She will literally kill for cash. It's her job. Failed criteria. 3. The war between Assassins and Templars is the foundation of our franchise story in the past and present. Not in this game, mate. It's not even entertained until a throwaway line from Cassandra over 100 hours into the game, saying both need to exist. And then she dies. And that's your totality of it. Failed criteria. 4. The assassin should always be agile, socially skilled, unbeatable with a blade, and a stylish badass. Okay, arguments can be made here. Leaping off anything and not dying can be deemed agile, and is a really quick way to descend things. But climbing and stealth approaches are slow and clunky. Socially skilled sort of comes down to the player and the dialogue choices, but most have an obvious effect so are easy enough to achieve. Unbeatable with a blade? Cassandra just isn't because of the combat design of this game. Grunt enemies are a huge fight and mobs of them will absolutely destroy you let alone bosses. She is very beatable here. Stylish badass? Only if you drop additional money on the in-game store. Look, there's just, there's not enough going in the win column here. So this is more failed criteria. Five. Pivotal moments in human history are the basis of our franchise. Assassin's Creed will always take a revisionist approach on real events. We'll use historical gaps to create our story. This game is based around the Peloponnesian War and all of the intricacies that a war brings with it politically. But after some very early story missions, the war is sort of forgotten. Everything centers around Cassandra's family, whether that be the family Atlantis or Cosmos storylines. It's all about her family. You interact with historical figures, sure, and are present at some events. But these aren't the basis, and this is just a fantasy story told in ancient Greece. It isn't revisionist at all. Failed criteria. 6. History should always be portrayed as relevant to our core audience, with facts that tie into present day common knowledge and edgy modern art direction. From what I've seen, the moments included in the game are accurate, and to many people, quite well known. If they aren't, you can easily look the facts up. But as with the previous point, these moments are sort of happening around the story, parallel to the story. Unlike with the assassination of Caesar or the death of Cesare Borgia, where you are embroiled in the middle of it. To me, that makes them not feel relevant. As for the edgy modern art bit, same-sex relationships and stuff like that is great. It shouldn't be classed as edgy as it's really just normal, but entertainment is really slow to catch up there. Also, in a game with a canonical female lead, we still for some reason have a playable male main character that can be picked in her place. Look, just for that sexism alone? Failed criteria. 7. Assassin's Creed is based on technology. Nothing is magical. Everything has a plausible technological explanation. Told you I was going to get to the mythical creatures bit. Every bit of supernatural and fantasy content in Odyssey is wrong for the series. Magic doesn't exist in this universe. Even if you're a fully fledged Isu, there is no magic. Everything is technological. Oh, but Doragon, the apple created the Sphinx and the Minotaur, and no, 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 no. That's not how the Apples of Eden work. We know this from 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 games ago. Humans were created by the Isu, and the Apples were created for them to exert some level of mental control over us. This is why Desmond can use the Apple to cause Abstergo guards to kill Warren Vidic, and then themselves. 
He has ISU DNA and can therefore interact with the apple and exert that control. A few of the apples, though, were used for data storage as well, including the one that Altair obtained. Hence, he could invent and see things that were hundreds of years in the future yet, possibly even Ezio and Desmond. But that's all the apples can do. Control and convey. They can't transform someone into mythical beasts, and if touched by a human without Isu DNA, they do nothing. This is series law laid out 11 years prior to Odyssey's release. Now, I've been told to get over this many times. It doesn't matter, it's just a video game. So let me put it into words that hopefully allow many people to finally understand how I feel about this. Get over Star Wars Episode 8 and 9, and get over Game of Thrones Season 8. It's literally the same annoyance. If people want those franchises to remain true to series lore, and were annoyed when they weren't, that same understanding needs to be applied here with Assassin's Creed. Anyway, failed criteria. 8. Assassin's Creed is about digging in a character's past through their DNA in order to understand what really happened in key historical moments. As with points 5 and 6, not really. Everything we're doing is parallel to these key historical moments. We're not involved with them enough to find out what actually happened as per the Ancestor's memories, because the Ancestor isn't involved. It's, it's like the Horrible Histories TV show, where a character is giving an interview about the Somme, while the actual Battle of the Somme is taking place in the background. But without the humorous element of Horrible Histories, Odyssey just falls flat. Failed criteria. 9. Since the player relives the deeds of their kin through their DNA, the IP cannot be set in the future. DNA of unborn people does not exist. Okay, so it's not Layla's kin, but narratively this was addressed four or five games ago with an advancement in Animus technology, so that's fine. We do relive Cassandra's memories via her DNA from two and a half thousand years ago. I do however question, with Cassandra still being alive, why we couldn't relive her memories of the last week and just skip over all the faff? Minor narrative niggle, but overall, criteria met. 10. Assassin's Creed can bend historical accuracy, but cannot create a Uchronia. I didn't know how to feel on this one for a while. On the one hand, Cassandra doesn't go around with an M16 shooting up ancient Greece. On the other hand, she may as well yell it's morphing time whenever she enters battle as she starts pulling off superpowered Power Rangers type moves. Pythagoras being alive 200 years after he should be, definite Uchronia territory, but then you get the legacy of the first blade, and they build the Giza pyramids in a single cutscene at the end of it. The Giza pyramids that were already 2000 years old during Cassandra's lifetime. That is a Uchronia and a disparate timeline, and that is failed criteria. 10 rules. 10 things that must be adhered to when making an Assassin's Creed game to be able to call it Assassin's Creed, as laid out by the developer of Assassin's Creed. Odyssey does exactly one of these things. It has the bulk of the playthrough set in the past. That's the only criteria it meets along the way. This isn't some fan saying, oh, I don't think it's Assassin's Creed because they don't wear white robes. This is Ubisoft telling us what makes an Assassin's Creed game and then not doing that for a game with Assassin's Creed on the box. However you cut it, whichever way you look at it, according to Ubisoft, the developer of this game and the entire Assassin's Creed franchise, Odyssey is not an Assassin's Creed game. Number 9. The Ubisoft Situation I said at the start that I would end every Ubisoft-based video by highlighting some of the issues at the company. So this is that section. In my Valhalla review, I had a Ubisoft Situation section. 
This sector of the review went over many concerns, from mismanagement of franchises and studios, to poor hires, and eventually through to abuse at the development studios. But even when making that review, I was blind to the sheer scale of the abuse. It's prolific, it's protected, and it's prevalent everywhere. Look at Ubisoft Singapore. If you don't speak French in that studio, bearing in mind that the three primary languages of Singapore are Malay, Mandarin, and Tamil, you are blocked from progressing in the company. Not just that though, meetings that entire development teams are to be part of will be held in French to make sure sectors of the staff don't know what's going on. This is why Skull and Bones has been locked in development hell, because the team simply don't know what game they're making and higher-ups refuse to communicate with them. Now that's just one example at one studio. One of Odyssey's executive producers as another example held all of the meetings that he chaired in a strip club. Now you have to be a certain type of person to go to and enjoy a strip club. I'm not one of those people, and if I was forced to attend a work meeting in a strip club, I would be hell or uncomfortable for the whole meeting. And I'm a straight white male, the demographic that is the only one to exist according to Ubisoft executives. I can only imagine what other demographics and minorities might feel when forced into such a situation. Okay, Far Cry 4 launch. Maxime Belland. Yes, that is actually the man's name, Belland. 20-year veteran of Ubisoft and a creative director. Choked a female employee at the after party. But he also made constant comments about the way all female employees dressed. He resigned in 2020, but only when all of this got revealed on social media and Ubisoft could no longer control the narrative. He resigned. He wasn't fired. These actions haven't tarnished his reputation or higher ability. He's basically got off scot-free. Alright, Escablades, aka Andrian Gabinigi, Ubisoft Development Liaison, sexually assaulted a woman. HR washed those reports away, as they have for so many others. Eve Gillamon, CEO of Ubisoft, knew about all of these and more, and did nothing. Let's forget for a moment that these teams currently make terrible games and people don't really want to buy or play them on that note alone. I'm not really surprised that the games are awful when you look at the work culture that they have to deal with. Most of the abuse is targeted at women or minorities. Now just imagine if you will, your mother, sister, girlfriend, wife, partner, a female member of your family being subject to a workplace such as described here. Imagine what it feels like for them to be subject to inappropriate comments, non-consensual touching, a lack of progression simply because they're female. Imagine having to hear about that daily and knowing that there's nothing either of you can do about it without risking the roof over your head. Imagine what that does to the mental state of both of you, one being abused with no way to leave and one trying to pick up the pieces. Imagine being denied a job simply on the colour of your skin, or because you don't speak a certain language, even though that's not an official language of the country that the company is in. Ubisoft employees don't need to imagine this, because they experience it. Daily. On July 31st, 2020, 1,000 staff just from Ubisoft Canada Studios, so Montreal and Quebec, to 3,000 person studios, signed an open letter calling out Ubisoft's lack of action on internal abuse and policies. As of the end of October 2021, two months later, Ubisoft had not addressed the letter or the staff that signed it. They had continued ahead in the same manner that they were previously. On an earnings call on that final week of October, Annika Grant, the chief people officer of Ubisoft, acknowledged many of the points made in the letter, and by the employee voice, a better Ubisoft. But nothing more was done. It was simply acknowledgement and more words of, we're doing something but you can't see. 
In that same earnings call held just before the beginning of the COP26 summit, a meeting of worldwide leaders to address the climate crisis, Ubisoft announced that they will be making pay-to-earn NFT and blockchain games. Three cryptocurrency setups with massive negative environmental impacts. With the scale of Ubisoft titles, the negative impact from these games would be huge and undermine a fair portion of what world leaders are trying to achieve. That is the Ubisoft situation as it stands right now. And all up, it doesn't look good. Number 10. Conclusion When I first played this game, I honestly thought I liked it. There was that nagging feeling of something missing, and I knew that it wasn't Assassin's Creed. But I thought, removed from the name on the box, it could actually stand on its own two feet. There are pieces of entertainment and art that are good in and of themselves, but poor for their namesake. The Dark Knight Rises, as an example. Good movie, poor Batman movie. But the slightest closer look than surface level with Odyssey, and that illusion starts to break. Odyssey is my least favourite game of all time, and I've been gaming for 30 plus years at this point. It takes something to do that in this era of gaming, with varied difficulty and accessibility options, cloud gaming and cross-save cross-play titles. It's a golden age of gaming that we live in right now. There shouldn't be any title that messes up so badly in this era that it ranks lower than a game that was such an embarrassment its developer buried all remaining copies in the desert. Yet, Odyssey has managed to achieve that for me. Whether through a lack of vision, a lack of leadership, or many small but significant factors, Odyssey just fails to do anything positive. Looking at it now, to my eyes, Odyssey never wanted to be Assassin's Creed. I don't think it ever actually knew what it wanted to be. Or at least, if it did, management dragged it so far away from that origin point that it became unrecognisable by the time of its launch. And every factor mentioned throughout this review is a contributing factor to me saying this. The blatant stripping of all Assassin's Creed series staples were probably primary among them. Literally all of them gone. We're talking story, gameplay, aesthetics, mechanics, lore, the whole shebang here. Just gone from the latest game in the series. I felt off playing this title back in 2018, and again when streaming it in 2021. I remember the feeling really well. A constant niggle that things aren't quite right. And as I progressed, it only got worse. It took me a long, long time to put words to the feeling for myself. But three years down the line and one massive review later, I think I may finally have it. Scrub Season 9 Now this may not resonate with everybody, because I know that Scrubs is becoming one of those old shows now. Damn, that comment made me feel old. But Season 9 came along after a beautiful ending to Season 8 and changed everything. It changed the location, the cast, the filming style... Okay, sure, you had pop-ins and cameos from old members of the cast, just to remind you that it was still Scrubs, but they were the only thing that linked Season 9 to anything that came before it. And as the season progressed, it became so unscrubs like that they started writing the original cast heavily back in to try and salvage a sinking ship. But it didn't work. And before the last episode of that new era aired, Scrubs was cancelled had minimal viewers, and died with a whimper, rather than the heartfelt barrel of laughs it had built itself on. Odyssey, to me, had a very scrub Season 9 feeling. Everything was different, and while not necessarily wrong from a game design perspective, from an Assassin's Creed perspective, it was the anti-Creed. It took all of the things that longtime fans loved, fans that had built the series, and got rid of them. The DLC tried to bring aspects of these things back, because they were losing their core fanbase, but it was a half-hearted approach, and a sticking plaster to try and stem the flow of an arterial wound. 
the damage to the series' reputation had been done. And while Valhalla would attempt to walk back a lot of the issues created by Odyssey, the original loyal fanbase that had been with the series since 2007 had already walked away. I'd like to thank you all very much for tuning in. There is more than I've put in this huge review that makes me not like Odyssey at all. Downgraded graphics and effects from 12 months earlier, Iron Man enemies in ancient Greece, I mean, literally, they fire repulsor blasts out of their hands, a lack of continuity in its own story, especially in the two DLCs where Cassandra loses her husband in Legacy of the First Blade, and then when offered to bring someone back from the dead in Fate of Atlantis, he's not an option, but a possible one-night stand from you years earlier is? Um, what? The complete rewriting of Isu history? And so, so much more within the game. I had to focus this review though, otherwise we'd be here for a very long time, and I'm not sure my tablet would be able to encode an ultra-massive review. I've tried to be as objective as possible in this video. I didn't want the Ubisoft abuse to colour my thoughts on the game in 2021, even though you can't overlook such heinous actions, and I wanted to present my thoughts in an understandable and widely digestible manner, though I'm not too sure I've done the latter one. I've not made this video to try and change your mind. If I have opened your eyes to some of these factors, I personally think that's a good thing, as it will hold developers to account and higher standards of finish and polish moving forward. If you do, however, still love Odyssey after this, that is your prerogative and power to you. I'm glad that you can get enjoyment out of it in spite of all these negatives I've pointed out. But that is my review of Odyssey. People have asked for it and now you have my honest and in-depth thoughts. But what about you? Has this opened your eyes? Has this solidified your existing thoughts? Can you personally not understand any of my distaste towards this game? Whatever the situation, let's have a nice civil discussion in the comments section below. In the meantime folks, please do the usual YouTube stuff, like the video, share it with the people you know who may enjoy it, hit that subscribe button and the bell next to it to see when new content goes live, but otherwise your viewership is more than enough for me. And until next time guys, my name is Doragon, this has been my review of Assassin's Creed Odyssey in 2021, and until next time, have yourselves a fantastic day, and take care.